Hey, today's August 20th, uh, 2018, and you're listening to, or maybe even watching, Human Factors Cast. We're on episode 102. We're going to be, uh, we're, I don't know, doing some stuff. We'll be back to talk about it. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Man, I do not know what's going on with these intros anymore. I'm just having fun with it now. Yeah, Nick's is having a good time over <laughs> here, just making stuff up. Making stuff up on the fly. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, back from being sick, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Back in it again. I'm glad to be here, Nick. There he is. Hey, Blake, we got a lot to talk about today. We're going to be talking about why are you working after hours? Uh, what makes VR surgery feel real? LA's new body scanners and making eye contact with robots. We'll be back to break all that down right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors Etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Okay, we're back. Blake, we got some stuff to talk about. We do? Yeah, I guess we do. We got lots of stories to talk about this week. We do? Well, we got four, but I want to know what's <laughs> going on. With, so it's, been, it's been two weeks since we last talked in proper podcast form, because you were out sick, and then I was out for a week. So what's been going on in Blake's world? Oh, Blake's world. So I was out sick for a couple of days last week, so I missed the podcast. Thank you, Woodrow, again for coming in and filling in for me. Awesome job. So glad to have you every time you get to come on. Yeah, you did great. Yeah, killed it. So, but over the weekend, Nick, I went and hung out with Elise and her father, or so my girlfriend and her father, and we actually went to Harry Potter World at Universal. It's a wizarding world. Yep, the wizarding world of that Harry place. Potter, that place. <laughs> and I got to say, like, in terms of, or like, like always the theme parks just kind of blow my mind just because of the, like, architecture they put into it and the design and all of that. But the interactive experiences alone were pretty fascinating to watch. And, it, like, for anybody that doesn't know or hasn't been to Harry po- the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, excuse me, um, you can purchase wands that allow you to basically run around the park or the, the area of the park. You can do different spells in the windows, and you can make things happen by doing specific movements with a wand. Um, and it, w- it was kind of funny going through and trying it out and also trying to, like, diagnose how you actually are doing this or what's allowing you to do it. Right, because you're talking about, like, these motion-controlled sort of uh, gesture-based uh, interfaces within the actual park. It's it's like a within a town, whatever. Um, but you're actually trying to get these wands to work in the way that you're wanting to. And they have people like standing there to help you out with these things, right? They do, yeah. They've got like people on like right on cue to help you like with the wand movements or make sure you're pointing it in the right place. Because right. it's not one of these things where it's the technology is not to the place where you can just kind of do the general motion in any in any like portion of space you have to be kind of like focused on a specific part of where the actual sensor is where you if you go and go to the park you'll actually notice there's basically a giant camera or what looks like a really big camera that's that really all it's doing is it's capturing infrared movement and then what and then it basically goes back and draws a picture on the back end and then interprets that picture as okay this was the motion you were supposed to make and these are the things i'm supposed to do like move the right. plates or like make the quill move something like that so it's just a really cool interactive experience to to get to be a part of and to see how it was i mean it's not 100 percent seamless obviously there's a lot right. of conditions they have to think about like the light outside yeah and i, I was i was going to say something i had a very similar experience uh where you know it it the degrees of freedom on this thing were such that it it was very stingy with with how you did the gesture right you had to do it just perfectly 
for it to register. And uh, it didn't feel good when you're sitting there two or three times trying to cast a spell where, you know, I can I can think of other ways to make it feel like you're learning a spell, so to speak, right? Where instead of doing um, a motion, like let's say you do the motion perfectly the first time, maybe some dishes fall over or something. And then the second time the dishes float because you, you know, there, there's a way to introduce some variety with a perfect uh, thing versus a, 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 um, a perfect wand wave, if you will, rather than a, uh, uh, what, what am I thinking of? Like a imperfect one or, or something that the system doesn't register, you know, like it's almost like some negative feedback, like yeah. something, something bad happens. You didn't or, do it quite right. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I think it's, it's a super like, I think the technology itself or their implementation of it is kind of like an infant at this point. Oh yeah. And I think it, you're only going to see cooler things happen, like either like building haptics into the wands or seeing kind of this negative feedback or different things happening, depending on how well you actually execute the spell. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean like even I, I follow the star Wars galaxy's edge, the star Wars land to Disneyland pr- development pretty closely. And I know they're coming out with some really cool uh, technologies for that land where where they are tracking your movement through the park and your choices within the park will sort of affect how other character actors in the park interact with you so like if you ding up the falcon in uh in the ride because you're in control of it if you ding up the falcon uh first order stormtroopers will come over and like congratulate you on ruining a resistance ship right like Oh, or, crazy, or the resistance yeah. will put a bounty on your head and, and you'll have to run away from them so it's 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 cool that Yes, that technology is being more and more integrated into these themed parks. Yeah, for sure. And the the other kind of portion of it that was that made it more of an immersive experience, and it's it's one of these things that only if you're like kind of a soundtrack nerd like myself, for sure. And then also like my girlfriend and her dad are like throughout different parts of the park, you hear different pieces of soundtrack from oh, different yeah. parts of like the movie and stuff like that. So it was just that little extra bit of immersion to it that you felt like you were really in like Hogsmeade. So it was, it was yeah. pretty sweet. Yeah. I, I, I turned you onto the sound- soundtrack show, right? It's yeah, yeah. 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 Did you guys listen to any of it yet? No, we haven't. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. They just did Back to the Future. Oh, goodness. That's awesome. Uh, and anyone who's, who's not aware of what I'm talking about, there's another podcast called uh, The Soundtrack Show by David W. Collins. And if you're a fan at all of, of any of this, uh, the soundtracks of, of motion pictures, uh, this guy does a really phenomenal job of breaking stuff down. Blake, I have to move on because I have to talk to you about... I, I'm going to get on my soapbox here. Okay? Yes. All right. Everybody get ready. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the importance of writing stuff down. <laughs> <laughs> On the importance of writing things down by Nick Ryan. Uh, because, because I was taught in graduate school to always write everything I think of down in like a little notepad. And I'm usually pretty meticulous about it. Um, so why were you taught that? I'm going to pull um, on some of these strings. Sure. Well, my advisor always gave it as, as good advice to write down ideas and, and sort of digitize them later so that way you can search through them. You never know when you'll have to come back to some of these ideas that you have. And one idea that I had uh, earlier last week as I was approaching my vacation was to, uh, to talk about something on this very show uh, for my banter piece because it was so perfect. Uh, and you know what? Wouldn't you know it, Blake? I didn't write it down. I didn't even digitize it into the show notes like I usually do. And now I am talking to you and our listeners about the importance of writing stuff down. <laughs> I literally lost sleep over this last night trying to think of what it was. And I have it's been bothering me all day. I literally cannot for the life of me think of what it was. But damn it, it was perfect. That's awful, it man. Was, I feel so bad for you. It was perfect for this show. And if I remember it halfway through this, I'm going to stop the show and talk about it because it was that good. That's fine. That's uh, It's really disappointing. Anyway. <laughs> well, on the importance of writing things down. I mean, that still makes a lot yeah. of sense. So write your ideas down and uh, don't, don't forget them because you never know when you might need them. All right. Let's get into some of these programming notes. I, I mentioned it the last couple of times, but hey, Alexa, play the latest episode of Human Factors Cast. Maybe she's already playing it. I don't know. Uh, we're now on YouTube. Uh, there's a slight delay because of production, but uh, you know, I ask for this every week. Uh, don't worry, we won't ask for it every week going forward just for the next couple. Uh, but please, 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 if you haven't already, go like, subscribe. That would be really helpful to us, especially because we need more subs to change the slash name to Human Factors Cast so you can easily find us. Uh, and of course, we still have that uh, free registration to this year's annual meeting going on for Philadelphia. We have a link out there for, uh, I think, Rafflecopter is the service that we're using. A um, couple ways to enter there. You can leave us a review. You can tweet at 
uh, H Factors Podcast and HFES, what you are looking forward to uh, with the hashtag HFCast. There's there's a couple ways to enter, uh, see the show notes for all that detail. But speaking of the annual conference, it is this year in Philadelphia, and that's from October 1st through the 5th. Do you have your tickets yet, Blake? It's coming up. I have I have my flights. So I need to get a hotel for sure. <laughs> okay, all right. So that's that's something. You have your your flights. I have flights, hotel booked, uh, and we're working through the uh, uh, the actual uh, conference admission. So um, please, 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 if you're planning on going to this thing, meet up with us. We are going to uh, have a booth there at HFES right by registration. Be sure to stop by. Um, you know, and part of, part of our partnership with HFES, uh, they're asking us to reach out to you guys, our listeners, to see if there's any notable figures or speakers in the human factors world that, you know, you'd like to hear on the show. We're happy to reach out and see if we can get some interviews with them. We're going to have uh, a bunch of interviews with plenary speakers, uh, past, present, future presidents of HFES to, to kind of talk about the organization. Uh, it, it's a really great partnership. I'm really excited for all this. It's going to be a busy, busy week. Um, <laughs> it's going to be so worth it, though. We're going to have a, oh. so much great content that will come out of it, and it'll be a, a fun little way to get the partnership started between us, us and HFES. Yeah, we really will. And, I mean, uh, we say it time and time again on the show. Where Our philosophy is no human factors practitioner left behind. We're hoping to bring you guys as much content from this thing as possible. Uh, and we just want to make sure it's the best it can be. So, if, again, if you guys have any recommendations for who we can talk to or uh, reach out to that's going to be there at HFES, let us know. We'll try to get them on the show. Uh, and of course, we got HFES Australia coming to Perth, and that's in November. So uh, we will have more coverage from that as well. Okay, Blake, you know what time it is? What time is it, Nick? It's time for Human Factors News. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of human factors. This is a fun one today, Blake, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's going to be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, robots. Whatever it is, as long as it uh, relates to the field of human factors, it's fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right. So up first, William Becker, a Virginia Tech Associate Professor of Management, co-authored a new study that claims employers' expectations of monitoring work email during non-work hours may be detrimental to the health and well-being of not only employees, but their family members as well. You don't say. I know. So their study demonstrates that employees do not need to spend actual time on work in their off hours to experience these adverse effects the mere expectation of av- availability increases strain for employees and their significant others even when employees do not engage in actual work during non-work times as the negative health outcomes are costly to employers what can employers actually do to try and mitigate these adverse effects that come from having to you know be on the clock all the time Well, Becker said policies that reduced expectations to monitor electronic communication outside of work would be ideal, but when it is not an option, the solution may be to establish boundaries uh, when electronic communication is acceptable during off hours by setting up off hour email windows or schedules when employees are available to respond. So, Nick... This is something you and I both have to like figure out in our daily lives, along with probably any other human factors practitioner out there. Like, how do you balance your work and your life? Yeah, I actually, when I was stopping by uh, Woodrow's office last week to see if he wanted to be on the show, we actually had a conversation about this very thing. And lo and behold, it's on the episode that he's not on because he had very sort of strong opinions about this. And so do I. I mean, um, I'm very much a, a supporter of strong boundaries where. You don't take homework. You don't take work home with you unless you absolutely have to. But sometimes it's it's just not an option. You have to take it with you, and you have to sort of uh, get the job done because you are beholden to other people. And it's unfortunate, but the best thing you can do to mitigate that is communication. Right? It's ironic, but that's that's at least in my mind. Uh, and it sounds like that's ultimately what Becker is trying to. Uh, facilitate here is that you do establish those boundaries and you do choose to communicate during specific windows, whether that's at work or uh, certain hours outside of work. Uh, That way there's these expectations. Yeah. And I think that makes sense. And also there's something else that they point out in the article too, about like when you're applying for a job or when you get a job, that your employer is making it upfront and known that, okay, our expectation is that you will be available to us outside of working hours. Right. And so before you even start the job or you've like, you've signed and dotted the 
I's and T's of that you're going to start this job by knowing beforehand, it should be able to help you out. Like the expectations already there that I'll have to be available. So it, the idea being that you already know that's kind of coming, you can already deal with the anxiety about it. But I totally agree with some of the points in the article about there's, there's an impact outside of just you. Right? Yeah. Cause I mean, I don't know. I've, I've got a lot of strong feelings about like that. There needs to be a, a pretty stark separation between work and home life. And I've, I've also been in the case where it's like, I have to make really tough decisions about, do I work this weekend because I've just got a large like workload yeah. or do, do I like spend time with my family? Yeah. And it's, it's a tough decision to make and it has an, a really harsh impact on not just like your employer or you, but also your family members. So it's, it's something hard that everybody probably has to deal with throughout their working career. Yeah. For me, I have a 60 mile commute, so it's a decision that I have to make, uh, before stepping out of the office. Right. I, to me, it's the, do I take the backpack with me choice? You know, like if, if I feel like I'm up against dead, a deadline that absolutely has to get done, that's when I will make the choice to bring the backpack with me. And when I say the backpack, I mean the laptop and all those, all the materials as well. But, uh, you know, if I, if I don't bring that, then that's sort of the line. And I say, um, I'm not working from home because I, I don't have the stuff necessary. Like I don't, I, I also believe in the clear boundaries when it comes to digital lives as well. Right. I don't on my computer, I don't have anything work related. I don't have our email server. I don't have our communication tool. I don't have any of those things. I mean, sure. I can access them online because there are online versions of these things, but I choose not to. And, uh, that's a very hard boundary for me because, um, it's easier to perform tasks like, building PowerPoint briefs or uh, writing up Word documents when I actually have those programs on my computer, my personal computer. Uh, and so I, I leave all that stuff on, on the laptop that I choose to bring or don't bring with me. And that's another, that's another digital boundary. Although it is, it is funny. I do have uh, the communication tool. I'm, I'm trying not to buzz market here. Uh, I'm sure you can probably deduce what it is, but I, I do have the communication tool on my phone, but that's only because uh, you know, I mute it on off hours so it it never sends me notifications outside of the uh, normal work hours that I normally work. So again, establishing these boundaries, and I, d I never check that thing either. When like unless it's when I'm on vacation and I'm expecting uh, news to come through about some user event or something like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it, I think that's the most important point. Like from this article, is really you just got to set the boundaries that work for you. Because some people. What, like the 24 seven lifestyle of always being connected and it, oh, yeah. it does a lot them some kind of freedom, right? Because you're able to kind of be off when you need to be off. And then also hey, you have access to doing work whenever you want to. Right. But for, I think a lot of people that end up working the nine to five, which turns out to not really just be a nine to five mm. and you're having to make those tough decisions, I think setting hard boundaries for yourself. And like you said, communicating with your actual employer is probably the best way to go to either figure out if this is right for you or find some kind of better balance. Yeah, I, I but I, I to get at the other point here where it affects others, I have definitely seen this where uh, if my partner sees the bag, the backpack, she knows that there's a po potential that I'm going to be working that weekend and or, or that night or whatever. And it means time away from her and it means uh, less time that we get to spend together. And I know it's just at the sight of the bag. She she knows. And so it's a. Uh, you know, unfortunate. And, uh, I mean, I guess it's, I, I don't know. I'm of two camps on this because it's like, it, what's the difference between this and perhaps taking homework home from school, right? Like it, it's the same thing. You're working at home, you're taking away time from others. And, but I mean, it's a, it's a necessary thing to grow for homework when you're talking about homework, but then why can't that expectation be there for work? I don't, I don't know, man. I'm like of two minds of this. Yeah, it was really hard. Like I, so example for my life, I went through this over the weekend because I mean, it, the the time came around, and you know, I I was sick for two days last week. There's right. a lot of deadlines coming up, and it came time that the weekend was here. And by Friday, like I would, I had so many meetings and other things that I had to do, even for my other jobs. Yeah, that I didn't think I was going to go to Harry Potter World because I needed to I needed to work to get things done for both my jobs, and it just it it was going to cause me anxiety otherwise, but like seeing the overall impact that it was going to have on like my girlfriend and possibly your dad, like, like 
it not being said that like I could I could pay back the ticket no big deal or whatever sure. but like the it was the lack it's of the time emotional. being spent yeah um that it, it was just like you have to make a tough decision and for me it was like I'd rather spend time with family yeah so that's the moral of the story don't bring work home with you unless you absolutely have to and when you do have to make boundaries yeah, set the boundaries <laughs> to work for you. All right, what do we got up next? All right, this one's really intense. So, for decades, pilots learned to fly passenger jets despite thunderstorms and engine loss using flight simulators. The fake cockpit bounced to mimic turbulence with special effects lighting and fire and hail. Well, now RPI computer science software engineer Nicholas Malief has created a such a lifelike virtual reality avatar by studying corpses of men who donated their bodies to science. The avatar looks so real that it looks more like an actual human suffering on the ER table than in real time and just pixels on a screen. RPI says that their simulations are the equivalent of flight simulators for surgeons. They allow students to accomplish mundane tasks like suturing a cut cut in a virtual world to build that muscle memory so that movements come more automatically in an actual emergency situation. So, Nick, we've talked a lot about virtual virtual reality and its application to the medical field and i think here is just like another one of these cases where they're kind of upping the fidelity of this vr experience to make it more real to make it seem like there's actually a consequence to what they're doing um beyond just like they're building up hours in a simulation sure and uh, uh, yeah i don't know how i feel about this because uh fidelity does not equal immersion and I've said that before on the show, right? You could have a low fidelity environment in which you are operating on uh, a, a digital cadaver, and um, you know y- you can still have the same sort of effect as a uh, full fidelity looks super hyper realistic, um, you know, s- situation. Now the, the difference where that breaks down is sort of uh, graphical fidelity, right? I can see where fidelity of you know the 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 analog to the actual human right if the digital cadaver has um body parts that are one to one with a human then then i can see where that's really important right if you're operating on a digital cadaver the uh organization of all the organs and tissue have to be in such a way like that's where the fidelity would make an impact and i'm not sure are they talking about that fidelity are they talking about graphical fidelity because it's it's a big difference and um i mean they talk about suffering so i'm assuming that they're talking more about the actual fidelity of a patient and less about the graphical fidelity so if that's the case then this is good yeah i think it's good it's it's one of these things they kind of so as it goes on they do a little bit of something that i thought was strange and so part of this kind of setup that they give for this VR program is for doctors and nurses to hone their kind of teamwork skills, but they give them this bizarre catastrophe that happens. So this is like this is like the scenario setup that they give. So about 600 American patients burst into flames each year on the operating table, um, and doctors and nurses are often so shocked they forget how to respond. So that's a little bit, that's something I'm not so keen on understanding what the purpose was. Like I get the fact that if you're trying to induce or increase like the actual graphical fidelity you make it look like an actual patient that's suffering on the table if like you can't give them anesthesia or something like that but in this case it's a little bit of a strange kind of weird catastrophe to have somebody burst into flames yeah yeah i mean like this is this is the equivalent of a of a flash thunderstorm or something for a pilot right like not not typically going to happen but like what happens if it's a perfect storm of all these different things, right? And like watching the video of this thing, it's absolutely ridiculous. They're operating and then all of a sudden just flames. Yep, got to <laughs> so extinguish him. They're definitely not talking about graphical fidelity on second watch. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just, it's, but it's interesting that even like kind of using, using their like their paradigm of having the per, the patient's like chest burst into flames, they still saw that like using this actual kind of virtual reality setup it still helped their VR responders respond a little bit better than just trained staff. So th- there's something going on here, but I'm not quite understanding what is really happening. Cause it's like you said, it's not necessarily giving you so super high fidelity and then it's doing, it's giving you this kind of catastrophe situation. That's not really applicable to the medical field. I don't think. Right. I think the difference is just being able to live through it, like to actually do the thing. Uh, you can train all you'd like, 
uh, with knowledge, right? You can, you can sort of understand something as much as you'd like, but it's not going to prepare you for the actual thing and the classic human factors application of actually training in as high fidelity as you can get uh, will actually help your performance on the job. The closer you can get, right? The higher fidelity with the actual training modules. And I guess what they're saying here is that the virtual environments here that they're looking at are of a fidelity, of such a fidelity that they will prepare these surgeons for these disastrous um, situations where the patient catches on fire. I'm trying so hard not to laugh. We're watching the video right now, <laughs> this yeah, thing happening. And <laughs> so if you're on YouTube, you're watching it too. But to, to watch this patient just catch on fire, um, it's, uh, it's something else. So I don't I, – yeah. I don't know what else to say. Yeah, it's it's one of those that, it, I mean, it still does the same effect of what you would want it to. It's a little higher fidelity training. It ends up with this. You're able to build muscle memory because you're actually able to perform the movements you would have to. I think that must be of some serious fidelity to actually perform some of these specific, like, cuts or sutures and stuff like that. So Right. And, I, I mean, it's not like it's not like they can put a cadaver on fire and just have it burst out into flames. So maybe that's another thing, right? It's, yeah. It'd be expensive to do that kind of training where they tell them about it. Hey, this is something that's going to happen, but, um, you know, actually have it happen on a digital cadaver. That's, that's something else. So I don't know. I, I don't really have a whole lot more to say about this other than graphical fidelity does not equal immersion, but potentially fidelity of, of, uh, the, tr- the training materials themselves. Yeah. I've got a question about what, what might increase immersion there. If you used, not like, not a cadaver, but like one of these dummies that they do have, what, do you think that would in any way help? Because it's more, maybe more realistic if you're able to give them some sort of organs that feel real or at least are very well mapped to the VR experience. Oh, are you talking about like overlaying the virtual experience with a physical? Yeah. Ah, maybe. Would that really I not mean, do anything different? that kind of goes with the the fidelity of the sensory right so so you're looking at uh, visual sensory input you're looking at auditory sensory input and that's tactile sensory input if you could overlay the virtual environments with the uh physical piece but then why wouldn't you just use the physical piece um well maybe the flames but i i, I at that point it's 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 less expensive to make the digital assets than it is to make the physical ones and if you that's why these uh contraptions that you put on your hands the spider grips that give you force feedback that tell you you know you're touching an object in the virtual world but you're not actually touching in the physical environment those are uh i guess sort of sought after um because they are able to mask that other sensory input that you are trying that you're lacking with traditional virtual environments yeah, so that would be kind of money better spent on something like that than using some real physical object. Yeah, yeah I think so. That makes sense. Yeah. All right, well, before we move on, I just want to thank all of our friends over at uh, Virginia Tech, Times Union, Associated Press, and TechCrunch for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, we are all over social media, or you can join our Slack channel for links to the original articles. We post those as we find them. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? All right, so this story is all about L.A. and the subway. So LA, Los Angeles' subways will become the first mass transit system in the U.S. to install body scanners that screen passengers for weapons, explosives, and other items, officials said last Tuesday. So the machines will scan for metallic and non-metallic objects on a person's body and can te- detect suspicious items from 30 feet away and have the capability of scanning more than 2,000 passengers per hour. In addition to the scanners, the agency is also planning to purchase other body scanners that have the ability to move around and hone in on specific people and angles. Signs will be posted at the station's warning passengers they are subject to a body scanner screening. The screening process is voluntary, but customers who choose not to be screened won't be able to ride on the subway. No specifics were given, but officials said that they they would roll out on subway stations in the coming months. And Nick, I feel like there's a lot of things to unpack in this one story about scanners in L.A., uh, mainly starting with the fact that if you choose not to consent, you can't use the service. Yeah, it's almost like they're optional, they're voluntary, but what what choice do you have if you want to get on the train? Yeah, to get to like make a really bad analogy, this feels like some of the dark patterns we saw on like, yeah. these privacy statements. Yeah, right? exactly. Like you can't use the service unless you give us all the data. I, I, let's let's first back up at the macro level, though. Like, first off, they are putting TSA level body scanners on trains, 
Um, and we've seen terrorist attack on trains, so that makes sense. And I, I sense that the public will probably have some sort of um, uh, disagreement with uh, the choice to do this, right? But it, it's all about safety. And uh, I guess the technology that they're talking about here is kind of these... Um, especially at, at these distant levels checking for things, right? So so they're looking at suspicious items from 30 feet or nine meters if you're um, not in the U.S., <laughs> you know, or, or one of the, what, two or three countries that use uh they use feet imperial. outside the U.S., yeah. yeah. So uh, nine meters away, right? And they have com- the capacity of scanning more than 2,000 passengers per hour. So that's good. Um, I have a feeling that the perception of this will be a lot like, oh, this is just TSA 2, where I have to walk through a thing and take off my shoes. And it doesn't sound like that's the case at all. It sounds like they are trying to produce these mass scanners that will um, rapidly assess uh, people as they come through and uh, will hopefully be less invasive. And, and it sounds like these more specific scanners are are more along the lines of, hey, we found something suspicious on this person. Let's point it at them and and see if we can get a better reading. And then maybe if we get a better reading, we'll go and approach them. Um, So that's that's what it sounds like to me. I'm curious if that's what it sounds like to you. Yeah, I mean, I think the way you describe it makes sense based off the article. I guess in my head, because it was that, especially with this like 30 feet or nine meters away, I was thinking that it was going to be super unintrusive, almost to the point where you're not necessarily even knowing it's happening. Um, but obviously that's not the case because you have to consent to have it done. And now that, now that you kind of described what you think is going on in terms of like, well, okay, if it catches something, we have ways to check different angles. Then obviously it's like a movable right. thing that a human will still operate. Um, so I don't know. I thought it was just more of kind of this omnipotent scanner that's watching you as you go through the turnstile. And maybe it'll ding or not let you in if it catches something. But it sounds like it's a little different than that. Yeah, it's uh, so they're they're talking about this. Uh, walking through a station um, where I'd imagine that's the consent. If you walk through this, you're giving consent and you know, whether or not that's enough for consent to, to scan your body. uh, That's another issue entirely that we could have a whole bonus podcast on, honestly. So, you know, I I think this is just, uh, I don't know. I feel like it's a, like it'll say, uh, metro scan station or something. And if you walk beyond that point, you are consenting to a body scan and, uh, presumably it'll be un- unobtrusive, but you know, at that point that you are being scanned. Yeah, that makes sense. So Ooh, uh, they're going to have to be really careful with how they deploy these things. Cause that, that sign's yeah. going to have to be super, I think explicit about what they're asking you to do. It'll be, it, it'll have to be explicit and in many languages. And, uh, because that's that's a whole other issue, right? Is trying to convey something to foreign travelers who are using our our metro station. Yeah, because th- then it becomes like, what if it's something something completely innocuous and mundane? Like if it it just goes off, like maybe uh, this is a bad example. Maybe somebody has like a metal hip, right? And so th- if it's somebody that's not from the states, maybe they're visiting San Francisco and things kind of go awry, right? For whatever reason, because they set off the scanner and they're not necessarily you know, coherent speaking English, I think a lot of, I think that could run into a lot of problems for different people. Now, of course, this is only being dropped in LA, but I think there's just so many implications for this. But at the same time, it's, it's hard to think that it's anything but trying to secure or make sure that it's safe to ride trains. Yeah. uh, Yeah. For me, it's, um, I, it doesn't bother me because I'm not trying to sneak pipe bombs onto trains. Um, and it, it only benefits me because I don't want pipe bombs on my trains. Uh, And if you think about sort of the critical infrastructure that um, train lines or or subways go under, that is uh, a massive concern. If you throw a bomb on a train and blow it up underneath a a building, um, that could have uh, a lot of negative consequences. Oh, yeah, all over the place, (laughs) for sure. (laughs) Don't get me wrong. I think that from a safety perspective, it makes a lot of sense, especially when we're talking about transportation. I mean, we do all of this. Uh, in the airport constantly and it's just a different mode of transport and we've seen terrorist attacks things like that the thing i worry about the most is this consenting aspect of it and then what that kind of is going to mean outside of the world so just in your everyday life and your if you're in smart cities listening to your conversations scanning your body as you go like walking down the street that kind of stuff i feel like there's got to be some kind of fine or some kind of 
pretty good line in the sand about how you're consenting that your body's being scanned or you're being listened to or any of that kind of stuff's being collected about you. Yeah, I mean, you and I are both on the same page. It's about the human factors issues with this, right? We talked about the smart street lamps uh, probably a couple months ago at this point now Yeah, where y- those are taking video surveillance. And um, I guess what's the difference between that and, and uh, consent with body scanners? Is it just because body scanners are able to get a little bit more intimate? Like, I, I don't, it's, it, th- seriously, Blake, we could have a whole Human Factors Cast Infinite episode on this. Yeah, we could, because there's a lot of different things to think about. Yeah, I, I don't know where to draw the line on this for this episode and this purpose, but I do know that this is going to be, especially if they're talking about consent, especially if they're talking about messaging, um, this is going to have to be something that's absolutely clear to people that they are being scanned and that they are um, consenting to this process. It's, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And in this case, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of reason not to consent, especially if you need to use the service. I mean, there's there's no way around it. So right. you just shouldn't be carrying anything on you that's going to stop you. Yeah, I, I can see why people would not consent. It would be a matter of, I don't want my body data being stored in some database. We know people who um, don't like any record of themselves being anywhere. We, oh, yeah. We know those people. Yeah, I know a few of those people. Without, without naming names, we know those people. So uh, the fact remains that if you scan my body, you have that data somewhere. Um, now, are they going to purge that data? I don't know. Are they going to use it for other purposes like monitoring traffic and seeing... Uh, what times of day are more effective and whether or not that's going to inform uh, new lines and new ride times. I don't know, right? But that's another question that I have about this type of scanner. Is it collecting your data? Is it storing your data? And how are you going to message that as well? Yeah, what does consent mean in this case? Exactly. Whew. And woof, This is a whole bag of worms. Yeah, I've, that's I've, a heavy one. I did not expect I, that from that story. I didn't either, honestly. <laughs> this, is a, this is a deep conversation. All right, we got one more story. Let's get to it. All right. So humans already find it unnerving enough when extremely alien-looking robots are kicked and interfered with. So one can only imagine how much worse it would be when they make unbroken on eye contact and mirror your expression while you heap abuse on them. Oh man, who's abusing robots? This is a future we can look forward to with a simulate simulative emotional expression robot or seer, a small humanoid head and neck that responds to the nearest person by making eye contact and imitating their expression. At present, it all alternates between two modes, imitative and eye contact. Both, of course, rely on a nearby camera that recognizes and tracks the features of faces in real time. While this is just an art project for now, the tech behind it is definitely the kind of thing you can expect to see integrated with virtual assistants and other human-robot interactions in the near future. Nick, this thing really scares me when I look at it. I can't really get past that. Uh, you know, it's it's weird how expressive you can be with just eyebrows and eyes because the mouth on this thing is not moving, the nose is not twitching, the ears are not moving. It's just eyebrows and eyes. And, I mean, I guess I'm, I shouldn't be surprised because, you know, they say the smile is all in the eyes. Um, and so if you're, if you're looking at this childlike um, robotic head uh, that is, supposedly imitates you right I, we're I'm imitating it at this yeah point. i know <laughs> i see that uh but i don't know it's can you imagine uh if we mentioned it in the blurb uh digital assistants uh we, we we talked about the a1 at the beginning of the show can you imagine if that was integrated with um with this technology where you're actually humanizing a robot uh that will sort of respond with these nonverbal emotional cues or potentially mimic yours because there are studies out there that, that suggest that you are more susceptible to behavior that is mimicked, um, even if it's delayed. So uh, there was a study by, oh, geez, I'm going to mess this up. I, it was either Jim Blaskovich or, um, oh, geez. I think it was Jim Blaskovich, but they did a, or Jeremy Balenson maybe at Stanford. Anyway, they, they did a study where uh, they, they put you in a virtual environment and a digital avatar 
you were you're having a conversation with a digital avatar there's a person behind the scenes but the digital avatar was mimicking all the moves that you were doing and but it was on a delay it was on like a five second delay and that five second delay was imperceptible to the person that was uh viewing these the avatar right so so let's say i'm doing something and and you would five seconds later do that same motion uh, it would be imperceptible to me that that was my own motion five seconds, I guess, ago. And so if we can sort of integrate that kind of level of technology with these robots, I don't know, I'm getting way off on a tangent here, I feel. But if we that, that's the kind of danger here is that when you are able to, ex, um, to mimic expressions in, from a robot, that, that's a whole other window into this human-robot interaction field that uh, we're so interested in. Yeah, and... I don't know. It's it's crazy that with with it only being there's a lot of things I don't even know how to explain here. <laughs> so it's it's, it's so it's only like a neck and a head, and like Nick was saying, there's no movement or expression besides given through the eyebrows and movement of the eyes, and also like a little the bit head. of movement of the, the head. head. Yeah. Um, but it it seems so real that it's it's a little hard to even believe, and it does give off the exact emotions that it's trying to convey, like either confused or sad or or like trying to understand what you're saying and i could see how like that interaction would really feel more personable it, especially in a virtual assistant even if you're not watching the mouth move or respond to you watching kind of these expressions happen while you're interacting with your virtual assistant i mean i think it changes the entire experience you know yeah and you know what one thing that uh this robot doesn't do that we do as humans is blink and i think that might be part of it right you don't want to um, you don't want to disengage eye contact by blinking with this thing. So you're forced to stare at it because you don't know what it can do while your eyes are closed. And uh, isn't that scary? That is kind of scary to think about, yeah. Right? Now, if if they, like, even if it's still sensing the world through other sensors like cameras or, um, you know, various other sensor technologies, if, if they're still sensing the world, you, the human, would be lulled into this false sense of security where, you know, you think it might not be able to see you with its eyes closed, but it in fact can. Um, but it would make it probably a little less unnerving for us as as the human recipient of these uh, robotic emotions. Yeah, because it's that same kind of concept you were talking about, right? Like it feels more natural because you're starting to see it mimic things that you're doing, even if you're not really perceiving that it's something you've done. Right, yeah, I, it's it's just a. Uh, I don't know how to describe this thing, Blake. Uh, well, a lot, of, honestly, Nick. I mean, they made the the call out for virtual assistants, but I I don't know. I see this kind of well, maybe it's I've just been to too many theme parks over the past couple of months, but I feel like this kind of technology integrated into theme parks with like things walking around or interacting with you as you walk through lines. It, it, it's like a whole other frontier or a way to like test these things out and see how people respond to them. Yes, and I just had another thought. This could be an interesting way to convey system status. So if you ask a, a digital assistant, I, I keep coming back to that, but if you ask one of these uh, robotic assistants for a question and it is matching it with a database, the, the thing that we're looking at here, this robot, could potentially express um, confusion or thinking, right, if, if it's... If it's trying to figure out the answer to your question, it could put its eyes up to the top left with the eyebrows raised in such a way that lets you know that the system is thinking. And uh, I just think that's that's an interesting way to kind of come about these uh, these new technologies where you're dealing with these expressive robots. Well, it's kind of like when you're in a meeting and you, you get to know your coworkers and you get to understand their interaction patterns when you're working, right? right. And so you, you start to either pick up on physical or visual or physical or verbal cues from them about when they are thinking, like what, what do they do? What do they, does their face look a certain way? Do they make certain movements? And I think this is the same thing. And it may reduce any kind of frustrations people get when they're like asking their virtual assistant a question or to do something if it looks like it's thinking. Right. Yeah. I don't know. It's, this is interesting to me and it, they, they call this out as an art project, but thinking about the way this could be applied to the way that we interact with, technology even if it's just uh, some sort of symbolic way to interact with these digital uh, robotic AIs I think that opens up a whole new nest of, of uh, interactions that we haven't 
considered yet or you know there's a there's a very niche field of research right now for yeah definitely and it's almost hard to believe this is just an art project and it almost it also made me get into the mode of thinking like what is what is art really going to turn into yeah all right reddit do it it came from it came from that's right. It came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. Any subreddit's fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and uh, encourages discussion among the community. It looks like Reddit's down right now. I can't even believe it. <laughs> I thought it was it's a jo- weird. Oh, 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 oh yeah. Nope. CDN not available to Reddit is shows. down. So we do have a couple of them banked up that we would like to get to here. Um, all we have, unfortunately, is the title and the subreddit, so we can't give attribution to the person who actually wrote these uh nor can we get access to the uh topics that they um or the the further details we just have the the titles of them so uh with with that in mind we will tackle a couple of these today so this first one here is on the user experience subreddit again i don't have a name uh the the links will be in the description so if you're curious you can go and figure this out later um, we will attribute them in our show notes. So this first one here is on the user experience subreddit. This is got lowballed on the job offer. How to handle? How do you handle that, Nicholas? That's a good question, Blake. I don't know. I've never actually had this problem. Uh, but one way, I mean, one way, I, I, it depends, right? Because, yeah, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> shut up. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> The more we do this, I feel like the more real we are with each other. So uh, the thing about getting lowballed is that if you are dependent on a job and you don't have a job, this is a real big problem because you are not being assessed at the worth that you think you are worth. And I guess the only way to come back and, and sort of combat this is saying, hey, you know, I was actually thinking more along the lines of this. Uh, and providing some sort of uh, counter to it and and hope for the best because honestly you know, if it truly is a low ball offer if you know uh, cost of living is not taken into account if your experience is not taken into account uh, if the company just doesn't understand what UX or human factors do that's a little trickier to get around but you know do your research and, and come back with a with an offer that you feel like is reasonable. And it's entirely possible that they'll come back and say, no, you're no, someone else will take this job for the, the price that we're offering. And, and you know what? You don't want to work for a company like that. That's my advice. Yeah, that's very true. I think there are a few, there's a few different ways around this. Um, if you feel like you are getting low balled, um, definitely don't just, unless you're in the situation like Nick kind of described earlier that you just need a job. If you're, if you have to go down the route of, okay, I, really in honesty i just need this job so i'm going to take it make sure that it's clear that there is like a uh, a pay scale uprising hierarchy right so that you will be able to get a raise and then if if that's the case and you start in like a three-month timeline like make goals for yourself to reach like you're going to provide this kind of you know data to the company or try and solve x number of problems or make teams more efficient try and put some metrics to yourself that you can really think about over that time period that you define whether it's three months six months or nine months and then go to whoever your hr person is or whoever is your pm and say like here's the things that i've done in this x amount of time that i've been here i would i want my compensation kind of changed i think i've i've kind of done by like changing the company or making these kind of impacts. I think I deserve it. And then you can hopefully reevaluate, reevaluate your situation from there. Also too, there's other things that you can ask for that are not necessarily just monetary. Like what if it benefited you to be able to work at home one day a week? Um, or if you had flexible hours, try and ask the questions about like, okay, if you literally can't pay me more, you need my services. I need this job or I like this job. Right. What are the other things that we could like try and make a compromise on? Yeah, those are all great points. Without getting into specifics, because again, Reddit is down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we can't we can't offer any more advice on this one. So uh, let's get into this next one here, which is also from the user experience subreddit. This is advice on contracting freelance UX design. Uh, so Blake, you've done some freelance UX design. Yes, I have. So okay, uh, I'm not sure what the 
desired advice here is. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'll, I'll give tough. you the pieces of it that I think are really important. So one, make sure that you're networking outside of just, you know, like trying to find people that give you contract jobs, like meet people in the UX community, join local, you know, user experience groups like the UXPAs or the IXDAs or Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. Join those groups and try and be a part of them and show show them that like by volunteering for leadership positions or helping out putting together events that you're a trustworthy person and that you work hard. Cause sometimes that's where I got, or that is where I got a lot of my freelance work was from other people that I knew that were like, I know that Blake can do front end work, or I know that he can whip up mock-ups or do a competitive analysis. Maybe I'll throw this stuff to him. Um, so that's, if you're looking for work, make sure that your network is really large or that you keep growing it. Um, specifically if you, if you, the only thing that really matters when you do contract work is make sure that you understand the language of the contract that you're putting together or the, they're making you sign. So, you know, the timeline of the project, the expectations, your deliverables, don't let statement, don't let yourself sign a bad statement of work that lets people rope you into doing a lot of work that you didn't really sign up for, but make sure it's clear stuck into. Yeah. Um, and other than that, just do a good job every job you get. Contracting's not easy to do, so it, you are all it's all about your reputation that you build for yourself. So I have a quick update here. Reddit is now working. <gasps> uh, well, at least for one of them. I don't know what's going on with the other, but the uh, advice on contracting and freelance UX design was posted by Their Alarm. Their Alarm. Their Alarm. And uh, their specific question was, uh, how do you get started in the contracting freelance work? And then how do you get leads? You already mentioned kind of the networking aspect of it, but how do you get started? How do you get started? <sighs> Again, like the networking is how you get started, to be honest, because that's the only way you're going to find jobs. One one great thing is nowadays there's so many services out there that you can just hop on and kind of say like, I know how to do X, Y, and Z. I know how to do UX design, research, UI design, like uh, Workable or Upwork. And you can try and bid for jobs on there. Um, and it's it's a grind. Like go, you have to like get, especially if you're just starting. I don't know like how long somebody's been doing this, but if you're just starting on any of these platforms now, it is tough because they there's a bunch of applicants out there that have a have spent a lot of time on these platforms, and you'll have zero credit on a platform when you start. So on on like nine nine designs, you've never done design on there, right? So it's It'll just get started, yeah. All right. Well, I got another update. This uh, the job offer one that was brought to us by uh, SCWCPRS109. Not even going to try and repeat that. Rolls right off the tongue. Um, let's see here. So they they go on to say uh, they got ten to thirty thousand less than what they know they can get elsewhere, uh, and they are taking talking advantage pay for our industry right now. I don't have much experience beyond a few months. But they need to quit. Uh, two factors come into play alongside being severely underpaid, difficulty of finding another opportunity, and having disclose a previous salary. So that is the the disclosure of salary. That's another interesting piece. I think California passed a law, at least, that you don't have to disclose your salary, your previous salary anymore. Thank goodness, because like I I would not want to do that. Yeah, I because uh, that can make you uncompetitive real fast, uh, real quick. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully other states will follow suit and, and base it on merit and uh, experience. I think that's another thing that we could bring up. Then there is, uh, you know, it, uh, they they talk about some of the pros of potentially accepting this lowball job offer where you get some experience on paper um, and then uh, some income versus no income. I, again, some points that we kind of addressed, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Do we want to revisit this one? Because all all of our all, all my advice still kind of remains the same with this context. Yeah, I think something that I forgot, and this sounds super sappy, but I think it's important. If you if you think you can find yourself loving the job, just take it. Mm, so sappy. Yeah, I mean, if you if you really think that it's a problem worth solving, and those pros that you mentioned of having on paper, it looks like I've got experience now more than I had before, and no income versus income. Those are enough reasons. Plus, if you think you can learn to like the job or enjoy the experience, right. then take it. And then apply for a job in California where they won't ask you about your previous salary. There you go. All right. Well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, stay tuned for the after show. we got some fun stuff coming with Command and Control. Uh, 
audio commentary. CNC. For the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us all over social media. Be sure to enter the contest. Tweet at HFactors Podcast and at HFES with the hashtag HFCast, what you are most looking forward to at HFES, this year's annual conference. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter, like I said, at H Factors Podcast. Drop us a comment on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Or you can leave us a voicemail at 901 646 1432. That's, oh, excuse me. That's 901 646 1 HFC. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or your favorite podcast directory. If you want to join the after show party, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my favorite co host for being on the show here today, Mr. Blake Arnstorf. Where can our listeners find you? You guys can find me at all the places on social media at Don't Panic UX. As for me, I'm your host, Nick Rome. You can find me choking on my own saliva uh, at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. depends.